Good morning. Good morning. I get to speak once again. Um, this probably could possibly be my um, last my yeah. last time to speak. This year. Uh, well, and this year, but I also have I'm going to chemo at the right after Christmas, and then who knows when I'll recoup from that and then be back on my feet to pick it up again. But Eric will be covering, uh, continuing on that, the Sovereignty of God series uh, that he's been doing. And um, just to say, I was going to, I was going to do a sermon on uh, security of salvation, security, uh, eternal security. Um, but I did call Eric, and he's evidently going to cover that next week. Or the, the week after. Or the week after. So, no sense double whammy in it when we can be productive in, a, in something else. So, today, um, my scriptures are, that I'm going to do are out of 2 Timothy. Um, these scriptures, this, this is, we know these letters, the 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, are, are Paul's letters to, to Timothy, a young pastor, um, and encouraging in him in that of his pastorship. But what are they doing? What is that, does that mean that as non-pastors you shouldn't read? You don't even need to read it. Not really applying to you. No, that's not right. The still the concepts and the things that Paul is giving to Timothy can apply to us also. And I'm, nothing more apropos than these three pictures today. I'm going to present to you. A faithful service. So whether you're a pastor or a lay minister in some way, um, which is what needs to be addressed here. We've done uh, teachings and sermons on the, the fact that all of us, everyone in this room that has received Jesus into their life as Savior and Lord, is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And in that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit gives you gifts. Now, we're not talking about like Christmas gifts that you unwrap, you pull out from the tree and you know unwrap it and then have a surprise. This giftedness that is in you is what it's talking about. It's a giftedness a manifestation of the Spirit that is in you, that is supernatural, in which you use this giftedness um, in ministry into the world, or to, namely, to build the church, to edify the church, to strengthen believers, and to bring more people out who are not believers into being believers. That is the kind of over, quick overview of giftedness. Because of our giftedness, our, the, based on the, what God has done in us and the, and the talents that He's given us, the things that we were born with. So we have both talent and ability based on the way we were born a certain way. Some people are good at music, naturally. Some people are good at math, not me. Okay? Some people are good at eating, me. <laughs> and though it, that combined your natural your natural talents combined with the supernatural giftedness of the Holy Spirit God has specifically called you into a ministry you're saying man Brian that's like your job no my job is to tell you about it <laughs> my job is to encourage you into it my job is to is to push you in and, and, uh, and challenge you to, to seek your giftedness and that place that God has put you in the body of Christ in ministry. There should be, there's two pastors here, and that is our based on our giftedness and our calling. But you are also gifted with a way to serve within the local body. We need and we need what we need. And God only, and God designs it. It's not, Eric and I do not decide what is needed. God does because he is the head of this church. 
He's the head of the body of Christ in its local expression. So he put you here. If you are here, you are gifted in a certain way to serve among the body. So we all have a place of service in the body of Christ. That is the quick pre-teaching to this. This, in 2 Timothy um, verses 3-7, through seven, let's read it, and then we'll talk about the three pictures that are presented here of faithful service. What does it mean to be, what does it take to serve as a servant of God in the local church? This is three pictures. Let's, let's read the, the scripture, starting in verse 3. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So we have three pictures today. A soldier, a athlete, and a farmer. And each of these, they're like photo like pictures that we can draw upon. Now, sometimes God, Jesus did this in the parables. He took common things that we were familiar with to make spiritual points that we are not familiar with. He took you know, growing grapes or sowing seed or, you know, water, wine skin, some things that the, uh, along the time of the day that they were, that they were spoken, they were very common things that the, the hearer would understand and be able to connect these things with the spiritual point that Jesus was trying to get across. And Paul is doing it here with three things. First off is the long-suffering of the soldier. We must endure hardships as a good soldier in Jesus Christ. Enduring hardship. Now, I can't... Raise your hand. If you have been in the military, raise your hand. So you probably would understand this better than for us who have never been in the military, of what hardships a soldier or someone in that capacity, whether it was Navy, Army, you know, I'm sure some people had it better than other people, but, you know, some people saw combat, some people did not. But the most, the idea is that it's not easy being a soldier. There's hardships that one must uh, face. I would imagine just a, just thinking about it, that it's a hardship not being near your family, being separate from your family. That's got to be the hardest hardship that a soldier, that a someone in the military would face. But there's other hardships. What if you are seeing combat? There's hardships in that. There's hardships in training. There's hardships in the fact that you want to do some, you want to do this, but the commanding officer says, no, you're doing this. You're standing guard duty in the rain. No, you're peeling potatoes in the mess hall. Whatever it is, there's hardships that you must long suffer to persevere. And I thought as I prepared this, I thought about the point that uh, Eric made in, um, in his teaching last week about the, that a big part of the Armenian idea of of, um, of eternal security has to do with persevering or that we persevere that there's a there's a um, you know working of God but there's also what our part in this working of God there's two parts to this to our salvation there's what God has done in a mighty way to save us and then there's our part namely we have to come to Jesus Christ in faith we have to take the step of faith but then once we're in, there's still requirements for us to do. And, there, and so there's this persevering through these hardships. Some of these things are hardships, and there's a, they're like a soldier that we must persevere on. To 
to endure. It's, I'm sure if you look at what Christians were facing in the writings of the, in the day these were written, you probably have it easy. If you look at what Christians endure in other parts of the world, namely with um, persecution, we have it pretty easy going in this country and in this place. Praise be to God that we don't have to endure, but what if we had to? How many would still be, how many of you would still attend a church meeting if it was illegal? If there was consequences of going to jail or having your livelihood stripped from you, there may be hardships that we know of hardships that they suffered. There may be hardships that we have to suffer or our children in the future suffer in the body of Christ. 2 Timothy verses one, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, Paul writes, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. We're able to endure both by our hardness, by our mental focus, and through the power of God that is in us. With that second thing regarding being a soldier, is focused as a soldier. No one engaged in warfare, and warfare entangles himself in the affairs of civilian life or, in, or of this life. That's the, in our text today. Soldiers must concentrate on the task at hand to survive. There is a focus into the daily life of the believer that we must attain. A focus on what? Jesus, God, knowledge, becoming more, uh, growing in the knowledge of God is big. We, Eric and I pushed the study of the scripture so much because we know that what you know about what this says is going to be directly uh, is going to be have a direct relationship with what you know on how to live your life or what you know is there in that God has given us in this gift in this gift of salvation in this relationship we have with Him. You won't know it until it is revealed to you through Scripture. There should be a focus in your life of becoming uh, gr with greater knowledge into what this is all about. Amen. Christians need to be careful lest they be distracted by the world. That is kind of what I see the Western, the Western church is very distracted by worldly things. We're distracted by materialism. We're, mis we're distracted by you know, money, materialism. We're distracted by entertainment. Um, I'm not a big football fan, not really kind of the spectator sport sporting person in me has kind of died off. I used to be big into spectator sports, but for some reason that's kind of, I can't explain it, it's kind of not become important. But how many people, how many people, how many men, how many men, I'm going to, on the men, because women don't really watch football, but can tell you all the stats of a favorite team. Oh boy. Oh no, really. Oh boy. I guess these things are changing. I don't. I used to be. I never. Women were big into football. I guess that's changing now. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't really engage in it in in a part of it. So, but so anyway, then I'll pick on everybody. How many people can name all the stats of all the players on their favorite on their team that they root for every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, whenever they play? but cannot see, not repeat, or 
say a single Bible verse. It seems to be a distraction. I'm not saying that football, baseball, soccer, you know, hockey are bad things. But they should not come, they should not be a distraction to us in the engagement of our faith in this, in this, on this earth. So like this, Luke 8.14, this scripture is part of a parable that Jesus said, so these are the words of Jesus, and Jesus spoke this parable about the different, um, it's usually called the parable of the seed or the parable of the soils, uh, the sower came, went out and through, through, he sowed, meaning that he walked along the, plow, the plowed ground and he took, in a, he took his hand in a bag of seeds and he pulled out a fistful of seeds and he threw them. That's called sowing. And some of the seed landed in different places. And different soils produced a different outcome. And he says this in Luke 8, 14. He says, The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. That's the gospel or the news of the kingdom. But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they do not mature. That's probably the worst thing in life for the believer is to never mature. Here I believe if you truly believe in Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, if you truly believed in that, you are secure in your salvation. But God did not send His Son to die on the cross to suffer, to die on the cross, and to be resurrected for us to remain the same. He's called us into a better life, into better living, and, and has given us, I think we counted it out, around 900 imperatives in the New Testament. In the New Testament, for the believer to mature in their, in their life, to mature in their walk, to mature into, into leaders. It's one thing that the church, Eric was just saying is almost like 500 out. We were talking out on the patio before this before we started here. And he was saying that he heard that almost like 500 churches closed doors a week in this country. 500 churches closed their doors a week. Why? I can tell you why. It's not because of finances, it's because of the lack of leadership. And it's a lack of good pastor leadership, but also the lack of developing any leadership among the laity. Churches don't just need a good pastor, they need people who will step up and lead among the lay people, will lead in different capacities. You have to mature to be a leader. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 through 12, says, this is Paul writing to, to Timothy again. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let's not be distracted by money, by entertainment, by the worldly things. Let's press on to be focused on our, our living, our not, of gaining of knowledge of God and, and, and putting off of these things that so plague us into being useless, useless for God on this earth. God has brought you here to be useful for Him. And being sucked into the worldly things and being so uh, caught up in them will be a hindrance for you to mature and to be useful. The last thing that a soldier is, according to Paul here, is devoted. He says that he, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier, his commanding officer. Now, in the days of 
People don't realize this. People in the days of when Jesus was speaking, the main army, the main military that they, you would refer to would be the Romans. Because they had taken over that whole area. They were in control. So a lot of, a lot of things that, the, um, that you see is, is you know, analogies about military, you have to think, well, they're looking at Roman, the Roman military. Well, a Roman soldier, believe it or not, was not loyal to Rome. Brian, who are they loyal to? The commanding officer, to the, to the guy that paid them. Rome didn't send them a check. They didn't get a, a little sack of gold and silver from the Roman government you know, every month. They were paid by the pockets of their commander. Julius Caesar paid his, military, his army to go to Gaul and take over Gaul. They were loyal to him, not necessarily loyal to Rome. In the Roman army was a lot of people who were not even Romans. By this time, in the Roman Empire, they would gotten so big that they didn't have enough Roman people to man the army, so the army was made up of people from all over the known world. But they were loyal to the commanding officer. The analogy there plays like this. I, I hate, and I kind of don't like to refer to this, is I don't like referring to us as like soldiers of Christ on this earth. Because that connotation kind of puts us in this idea that we are against other people. But we're not. But Paul here is writing that we do have a commanding officer. We have Jesus as our commanding officer. How loyal are we to him? How devoted are we to him? Second Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10 says Paul's attitude concerning himself. So he says, So we make it our goal to please him whether we are at home, in the body, or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us in the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We are as secure in our salvation, but we do face judgment. Like, Brian, what do you mean face judgment? Yeah, there's two... In the end of ends, look at Revelation, the Revelation. You get that there's two judgments. There's two judgments. There's one, the great white throne judgment. It's not really for us. God, God sits on his throne and he separates the goats and the sheep. The goats go through, which are the unbelievers, go through the great white throne judgment and that is where their lives are given account for uh, what they've done and it's based upon it's judged against the law. We go through the Bema judgment. That's when the scrolls of our lives are opened and we have given account for what we've done for Christ on this earth. We are in, in the things that we've done, we are given crowns. Um, the idea of the Bema seat is a old the oldest Olympic tradition. It is the judges of who would judge a competition, say a, a running competition. If you sat on the Bema seat, you were a judge for the competition, and you would determine the winner, and you would reward the winner with a crown. Now the crown was what you think about. Like you put on a king, the crown was like a, a, a wreath of olive branches that would be decorated and that would be a, your reward for winning the race or winning the competition. So Jesus sits on the Bema seat and he judges us according to what we have done and we receive crowns. And Paul is saying here that... that we want to please Him while we are here on this earth. We want to, to do our most to please God and what He wants us to do on this earth. To 
uh, to achieve the mission to, 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 to send out the gospel to places where it's never been heard, like missionaries. And sometimes that missionaries aren't necessarily to foreign countries, but they might be down the street. And we will face judgment, and in this judgment, receive crowns for what we've done. Let us not face this time and be crownless. Colossians 1.10 says, so that, you may, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Let us please God as we are soldiers and He is our commanding officer. Let us endure hardships. Let us be good soldiers in the army of God. Next thing is that actually of an athlete. He writes of the obedience of a of a of someone who is competing in an athletic event. He says similar in the verse five of Second Timothy two is a similar similar. I'm going to not get that word today. Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So athletes understand that in their given sport that there are rules that they have to abide by. Christians are under no less obligation to go by the rules. Now what are the rules? Those are those imperatives. Call them the rules. That's a, I don't even like that word. Does anybody like the word rules? I don't like it. I don't like it. But if you but if you have Jesus in your life, this is hard to understand. Because we get this idea that that grace is so just one sided. Faith is required of us to be saved. Amen? So we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. That's our response to the grace that we have. The response to the gospel that we've heard, which was God gave us through grace, sending His Son to die for us, sending His Son to live a perfect life, to be the sacrifice. These things are His that are grace, but we have to respond in faith. But faith is two things. It's just not believing that He did it. There's a... Having faith is to trust Him and obey. It's a trusting and there's obedience attached to that word. You cannot have faith and not trust God enough to obey it when he says to go. Or to not do that. Or to live this way. Matthew 28. We're familiar with this passage. Jesus' words. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20 says. Then Jesus came to them and said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And here we go. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. There's two sides to that, both of that passage here. There's a side that when we were the receiving end, somebody told us the gospel, and then we received it, and then we found ourselves into a church structure somewhere in which they were supposed to, at least, show us everything that Jesus commanded and to encourage us to, to live that those commands. Obedience is part of our saving faith. Let us obey the rules. 
so that we can compete in, in and not be disqualified from receiving the victor's crown at the end. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That's right. So obeying Jesus' commands is a part of saving faith we have in Jesus. Amen. The second part of being an athlete is being self-controlled. Note the comparison uh, by Paul regarding athletics in another, uh, in another book called 1 Corinthians um, chapter 9, verse 24 through 26. It says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes in, into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will, yep. that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. Let us not feel that we are aimlessly running in this, in, in this competition to get the crown. We are running. We are in this race. We are enduring hardships. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're devoting ourselves to our captain. We're doing these things that the picture, these pictures are showing, but we're doing them for a reason. At the end, we receive the crown of righteousness that is imperishable. And that second part of that, we, there's training involved. There's a part of this that is discipline. There's part of the Christian life that is discipline. There's a lot of it that is rest. Too. There's a there's this like remember I'm saying there's what God's work is, and then there's our work, and maybe it's around 80-20. 80 percent God, 20 percent us. I have I'm in my study of the word, I constantly come to a different ratio. But it's surely not 55th. There's no way we do what God does. Or have the ability to do what God does. But God does an amazing job. It does in our lives and we and it's, and we love that, but there's a, when it comes to to engaging the discipline it takes to do what we're supposed to do, we get a little, hmm, well, maybe it's just, it's easier to believe in grace. But there is the works that we need to do that are expected of us. First Peter 1, verse 3 and 4 says, Praise be to the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in <clears throat> In His great mercy, we have been given a, a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Let us run for that. Let us move on to the third picture. So we have the picture of a soldier, the picture of an athlete, and lastly, the picture of a farmer. And the, the basic way it says that the farmer is hardworking. He's a hardworking guy. Now, how many people have ever been a farmer? How, how many people have farmed? I don't know many farming people. So you're a farmer. You farmed. We've got two? Two people? I don't know what it's like to be a You farmed? Or you know what being a farm person, you know, what it takes to, to grow crops and to, to take care of a farm. Something that's kind of beyond our, it's out of our realm of understanding. I don't know what it takes to take care of a farm and to grow crops, and, but it's surely no easy task. To Christians, labor any less in the vineyard of the Lord? If the, I know this, that the farmers up way early in the morning and they go to sleep late in the evening. And there's not much rest and taking breaks and on their cell phones and playing video games and watching football game. There's not much of that in between. 
It's all hard work of feeding the animals and plowing the fields and watering the and watering the, the, the crops and getting and taking care of all that has to do on that farm. It's no easy task. It's, it takes a hard working individual to do it. And we should be as diligent as a farmer into our lives, into our walk with Jesus as the farmer is. Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the field. There is a great work still left on, this, on planet Earth. There's a great work still. We think that after 2,000 years of, of Christianity, that we got, we got it, but it seems that we've lost, we're losing ground, and the church is supposed to be more busier, needs to be more busier today than any other day, because how many 500 churches failing? How 30 less than 30 percent of our of the population of our country would even uh, say they are a Christian or to, to profess anything about uh, a a belief in Jesus, less than 30%. John chapter 4, verse 36 and 37 says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Don't you have, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the, at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Then lastly, the last quality of the farmer that we should... Uh, take into our, our lives is that he's motivated. It is a hardworking farmer who enjoys the benefits of their labor first. Do Christians not have good motivation for being in, you know, being diligent in their labor? We enjoy a first fruit of a crop. Have you ever I'm just have you, you will grow the most. You will grow the most. It's like, um, Mia, until when you left, whatever time, whatever that age is that you left your mom and dad's house and got out on your own. Wasn't that the biggest, most huge part of your growth in your life? When finally you got out from the shell of the people that paid all the bills and you know, took care of every little thing, and then you got out on your own, and you had to do it yourself. You had to pay the bills. You had to get a job. You had to do the laundry. You had to cook your food. You had to go buy your food. It was the greatest experience of growth. And same with the believer when we step out in faith in our ministry and do it. You're saying, I don't know what I'm doing. No, you don't know what you're doing. You follow the leading of the Spirit in your life, and that is the best what you're going to do in your because you're going to grow in a mighty way in your in your strengthening in your spirit. That's the rewards you get from being diligent and being motivated. That's the motivation is growth in your life when you are diligent for the works that God wants us to do on this earth. And for some of you. It may be simple things. It may be more difficult for others. God, has, like I said, He gives us works to do. He gives us ministry to perform. And it's not the same for everyone. Some people are more gifted than others. But we're all here to, to make one big church. Like the puzzles of a, like the pieces of a puzzle that fit together to form one picture. That is who you are. You're a piece of the puzzle here. And you need, it's a, there's a, there's, the church needs you to know your giftedness and to, to be diligent and working in your giftedness for the edification, the building up of the body. 
Therefore, my brothers, and this is 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 58. Therefore, my, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Romans 6, verse 22 and 23. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap uh, leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Savior. And lastly, 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Now, that there, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on, the day of, on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. These three things. We have a picture to look into, to, to compare to our lives. Are we the soldier? Do we act as a soldier does? Do we act as the athlete does, who trains and runs for an imperishable crown? And are we like farmers who work day to night, laboring for Christ in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces, in our, uh, in our grocery stores, in our, in our shopping times, in our, our golf times? I don't golf, but... That's the challenge today. As the hearing of this, the hearing of Paul's encouragement to Timothy to take these three pictures of our part, our service to God, our faithful service, and to, and to grow in that. For those who do not know what their giftedness is, you first need to pray. You need to be in prayer for it. And then to be listening for the response. And then, once you've done that, come see Eric and I. And say, listen, I feel God is gifted me in this way. Where do I, can I fit in here? Where, where can I serve in the church with this giftedness? Come see us after you've done that. Don't come and see us before because we have no idea. God doesn't speak to us on your giftedness. God speaks to you on your giftedness. Amen?